scholars for this year. And part of the, and you'll hear from the other two scholars later uh, in the in Grand Round series, but um, here's our first. And I know some of you have already had a chance to get to know and work with her, but um, Miriam, she's obviously going to talk about her plan. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the title of my talk today is Understanding the Decision for Hospice, the Importance of Family and Advanced Care Planning. So prior to going back to school for my PhD, I was a hospice social worker for a number of years. Um, and I'm currently an assistant professor here at SLU in the School of Social Work. And as Marla mentioned, I am a geriat one of the first cohort in the Geriatric Leadership Scholar for the GWEP program. Really excited to be sharing um, some of my research with you all today and, um, and, and just really excited to be here. So a little bit about what led me into this kind of work or really what led me back to my PhD was as a hospice social worker, I became very interested in how late patients were coming to me um, and, and how quickly they were dying. So I really became interested in how we can overcome some of these barriers to care and how we can connect people to services earlier. And so I'll be sharing uh, uh, several studies that kind of throughout that I'll give some background on, um, but, but we'll start with some acknowledgments here. Um, the, the research that I'm sharing, I collected data from while I was living in Texas at Community Hospice of Texas and I was going to school as a doc student at University of Texas Arlington. No financial relevant financial relationships to disclose though. Some objectives for my talk today. Um, I'm really wanting us to put a magnifying glass to the decision um, for hospice care. So really looking at what motivates uh, patients and families to choose hospice and hearing their perspective a little bit and understanding the timing for that decision and really what factors precipitate that decision. Uh, as well as demonstrating the important role of family in the decision for hospice care and the overall importance of how, um, of early conversations, right? And as professionals, I've geared this towards physicians, but really I've given similar talks to social workers and I think it's important across um, healthcare professionals in general, as we all at some points in our, t in our career are having these conversations with patients and families and the importance of starting those conversations early. Uh, and also in supporting this, the healthcare professional's role in reforming perceptions um, of what hospice actually means and how that impacts when families are choosing hospice care. So really the context of the physician's role in understanding um, in, in, in what I'm talking about today in, in the decision for hospice care. Uh, one is this new Medicare requirement um, that they'll reimburse for advanced care planning, uh, which I think is a, an important time for physicians to be able to have more of these conversations earlier and be able to get actually paid for them, because I know they do take time. Uh, and then also the Medicare requirement for that for those patients who are choosing hospice care, they have to have this six months prognosis, right? And so physicians are the ones who are actually looking at patients saying, yes, I think that I wouldn't be surprised if six months from now this patient were uh, no longer with us, um, and also looking at some of the other requirements that make a patient um, eligible for hospice. And there's lots of information out there, I think, that, that really demonstrates how important the physician is in, um, and influencing decision-making for patients. There was one recent study uh, that looked at chronic illness, and 68% of those patients, I think there were over 2,000 of them in that study, 68% um, of those patients preferred that the physicians still make the decision. So we know physicians are, are largely um, important in when, uh, the timing of when patients are choosing hospice and how important their um, guide is in that. So even though physicians are um, strongly influential, there's a lot of physicians out there that will say, you know, I don't really know when the best time to bring this up is. Um, so when should I be discussing hospice as an option for care? How do I talk about hospice care with my patients? And um, when should a referral to hospice actually be made? So you may or may not see yourself um, in this particular, and we'll, we'll say healthcare professional, um, since I know some of you aren't physicians, but um, by the end of this presentation, we'll show another slide and we'll change these questions into statements um, so that I hope that you're able to take something away from this presentation in knowing when and how to have these conversations with patients. So a little bit of background before I get into um, kind of the crux of, of my talk today, which is really in understanding this decision for hospice care. Um, a, a couple things we'll go over are why is hospice care important? Um, and bear, some, we'll, we'll go over current literature and what we already know about barriers to care, uh, the role of family and how they're already important in these decisions. 
as well as the studies that I'll be referencing throughout um, where I've gotten my data from, uh, from, from my own data collection. So I'm, I'm talking to a group of geriatricians who really kind of already gets this, which is great. But I've given lots of talks about hospice to a number of different groups. And um, one of the things that often comes up is, ooh, well, when I die, I, I only want to be on hospice for like a day. Like I really, that doesn't sound like a good thing, right? Um, and some things that we know about hospice is that within the general population, those who are not on hospice care overall, 50% um, are dying in, in the hospital. And when we look at what the environment is like in the hospital, there's lots of machines, there's lots of noise, there's lots of people poking and prodding, versus those who are on hospice um, services, 75.9% are dying at home. And we know from a lot of national surveys that people prefer to die at home, they want to die at home, but if we look at the general population, they're not. Right, so that's one, one positive thing about hospice, that hospice helps people die in place. And um, that includes nursing homes and residence homes, which is deemed as home for those patients. Other things to look at, um, and there's been a lot of comparison studies of hospice versus other types of care and what that looks like. So just looking at rate of survival, we know that, that looking at national Medicare studies, um, patients who die on hospice when matched with those who don't die on hospice by age, race, diagnosis, other things, those on hospice actually live longer, um, which is unexpected. I think people think they go to hospice and they die. Hospice equals death. Um, but because of the attention on the quality of care and the quality of that life, they're actually living longer with better quality. Um, so, like I said, the quality of death experience, um, there's a lot of surveys where families mention um, higher satisfaction with care, when on hospice versus other types of care. Symptom management um, is better uh, within palliative or hospice training prog or programs. Pain management is, is better. Um, the focus is no longer on the disease itself, but on the symptoms that are there because of the disease and, and helping people live the best that they can. I think the general picture that people have when they think of hospice is someone who's bedridden, um, very close to death, which is true for a large number of patients based on the timing of our referrals, but there are a lot of patients who are appropriate for hospice much earlier in the process um, who, who do have great quality of life, who can still get out of their homes, who can enjoy things like music therapy and art therapy and all of those kinds of things that um, bring quality, right, that they may not be able to get in other systems of care. There's also studies that suggest that bereavement period for families is um, less difficult when the family members received hospice care versus um, when a patient's died, let's say, in the hospital without hospice care. And lastly, the cost of services. There's studies that have looked at the cost of um, hospice care or for patients on Medicare who have received hospice, again, matched by age, diagnosis, race, um, who did not receive hospice care, and there's significant cost saving for those who were enrolled in hospice overall. So really, this is just an overall picture of when I stand up and talk to groups about hospice, why I think hospice is important. And as someone who, who really, as a, a young social worker, when I started my full-time job in hospice, um, I knew what hospice was, but, but my experience of being in hospice really changed my perception. Um, you know, and that hospice, to me, isn't really about death, but it's about living well. And, um, and, and I think that this picture kind of helps portray why we should be getting patients to hospice sooner and that there's all of these benefits to this type of care. Some more background just on barriers, what we already know about why people aren't coming to hospice. You can see the roadblocks here. One of the first ones um, is this idea of eligibility and election, right? So we know that for someone to choose hospice, they have to be foregoing curative care. And there are some, some changes, hopefully, in the works towards that. I know Medicare is doing some um, demonstrations where they're looking at, at um, people being able to access curative care and, and um, palliative care at the same time. But historically, and for the most part, people have to choose hospice over curative care, um, which is really delaying a lot of people in, in accessing services. And also this idea of establishing prognosis. You know, when is that six-month marker? When, how do we really know when someone's approaching death and how difficult it is? Um, and if we look at how people die, um, most people die of chronic illness. And chronic illness uh, trajectory to death doesn't really look like this, right? We know chronic illness looks like a roller coaster. People get really sick, they get better, they get really sick, they get better. 
um, for a much longer period of time than six months. So it's really difficult to pinpoint that six month. Some other barriers related to communication. Um, we overall live in this culture where we don't like to acknowledge death. We don't like to talk about death and it really is a barrier. There's a lot of discomfort that goes along with sitting down with someone and having a conversation about their wishes as um, end of life approaches. Uh, both within families, within medical setting, health communication. Um, and, and also, I think culturally, we, when you hear hospice, you think death. And um, I'll talk a little bit about my understanding of the meaning of hospice and some of the work that I've done and how it's changed with the experience of hospice. But that's been a big barrier to people wanting to sign up for services. Just like whenever I give talks and people say, hospice, you think it's a good thing, right? And yes, I do. Um, and lastly, there's a lot of cultural barriers. Currently in the United States, we have maybe 80 to 81% of patients who are on hospice are Caucasian, right? And so that's, and only 19% are um, other races. So we're, we're really looking at some major cultural barriers um, related to distrust or family care or um, a number of other factors that are limiting um, access in certain communities to hospice care. A little bit more background, um, since I will be talking about the role of family in the context of this presentation, I wanted to give some background about what we already know, about why family is important in end of life. Um, in hospice and palliative care, it's not just the patient that's served, right? We, and it's, this is how it's defined in, in Medicare standards. It's about the patient and the family. The family is very much an integral part of the hospice team. Their role as caregivers. In, in a national caregiving survey, one out of every three households in the U.S. have a, someone, a family member serving as an unpaid caregiver. So if we have one out of three households where someone is, is serving as an unpaid caregiver, that just tells you the number of family members who are already involved in he health care decisions for a loved one. So family members are really involved in these kinds of decisions. There's also um, lots of family involvement in decision making. Cultural preference for decision making. I used to, uh, and I know from a medical perspective, we're all taught about patient autonomy and how important it is that a patient can make their own choices with care. Um, but there are a lot of cultures who prefer for family members to serve as a decision, or a decision maker. Uh, and I think that was really hard for me as a young social worker to wrap my head around when there was a, a, a family member or a patient who was you know, really directing all decisions to the loved one or if I met at the door doing a hospice in admission and the family member says, don't tell mom or dad that they're on hospice, right? And that totally goes against our idea of patient autonomy. But really trying to work in that environment of not lying to patients and answering all the questions that they may have, but allowing them to decide if, if they want a family member to be making decisions for them. Uh, advanced planning, we know, is, is an important part of how decisions are made um, and often we're asking our patients, do you have advanced care directives? Have you talked about what your wishes would be? And proxy and surrogates, right? If a patient is unable to make decisions, it's a family member generally that we look to to help make those decisions. And overall, just family communication and the importance of that communication as people make decisions and how they talk it over with their loved ones or have family meetings and those kinds of things. From a theory perspective, just really briefly, I'll talk a little bit about some of the theory that guides some of the work that I do. Um, family systems theory, and, and really just looking at the difficulty in separating any one member of a family from all of, from all of the other members, um, and how important it is to consider that, um, and that every member is, is influenced by the experience of one, and that you really can't separate that out um, when, when trying to look at things like decision making. And secondly, a second theory, Wynn's epigenetic model of family processes, which this chart gets a little bit confusing and it's a little fuzzy. But if you look over here at the left in the first column, um, it basically says that this is a process. So you start with, and, and you can't complete any successive levels until you've completed the, the first level. So basically saying that um, each one builds. So you start with attachment and uh, um, caregiving of the fam within the family. And so you can't really have good communication with a, within a family until you've built this, this attachment phase. You can't really have joint problem solving until you've mastered this um, family communication, which is built upon this idea of uh, family attachment. And these columns to the right are things that can happen if you haven't um, built one level on top of the other. So if, if we're thinking in the context of a decision for hospice care, 
I see this a lot. So we see a family who's trying to make a decision, um, a joint decision about hospice care, and maybe they just keep putting it off, this evasion of problem solving. They're just putting off this decision because they're, nobody's really communicating about it. Uh, nobody has the same opinion. There's disruptive disagreement. Families are getting into arguments. Um, so really, there's just this process of not being able to make a decision because there's not that basis of family communication or this basement of attachment first. So just one of the theories that kind of guides my thinking about how all of this relates. And there's some literature that suggests that this model is really relevant to medical decision making and palliative care. So very briefly, I'm gonna just talk about several studies that have, has informed my presentation for you all today. Um, the first of which was a qualitative study that I did with hospice patients and families, really asking them about their process for making the decision for hospice care. So these were people who were already enrolled in hospice, and I was going to them saying, so, you know, tell me about your decision making. What made you choose hospice care? And I was also interested in this idea of family relationships and communication and how that may or may not inform um, their decision making at the end of life. There was, my sample was 18 interviews. Um, there were, as you know, with hospice care, there are often times that a patient can't participate, so I interviewed family members instead. Um, but overall, there were five patients who were able to participate and 22 family members within those 18 interviews. Does that make sense? So there were 18 patients, but some of those were family members, and often more, th more than one. That really led to a second study. Um, go ahead. It was one-on-one, -on -one. so I did 18 individual interviews. There were, um, so when I say one-on-one, -on -one, per patient specific. So I had one patient, maybe I was talking to mom and sister for that one patient. At the same time. At the same time. Yes. So, and then, um, or the patient. No, they weren't one-on-one, -on -one, but they were, they were individual to the patient, is what I meant by that. So I wasn't cross, cross like mixing family members for different patients. That makes sense. I was looking at each individual experience of the process. And there were some pros and cons to that. I mean, some cons in that, you know, my sample differed from, from each patient on who I was talking to. And that was just with the nature of the population and what um, I was able to get at that time. That really led to um, a second study where I was wanting to look at a larger picture of this because some of the things that came out was that there was a lot of family communication um, that was happening. In, in terms of, of how that impacted decision making. And there was also something that came out related to referral source, so who they really learned about the information from. And, and I wanted to look at that in a larger study, so I did multiple regression, um, looking at those two um, variables in particular on hospice utilization. And if you look at my control variables, and if we were to go back to my you know, barrier slide earlier, you would recognize all those same ones. So all of these are, are basically from what we already know as barriers um, to, to hospice care. This um, hospice utilization in the literature has often been looked at through length of stay on hospice, right? That's how we kind of think about hospice utilization. So a second variable that I added to that was this idea of decision time. So really, how long is it? And the question that I asked people was, when did you first learn about hospice as an option for your current illness? And then I looked at when they were actually enrolled in hospice. So they might say, and, and this was an imprecise, a bit imprecise, because they might say it was two weeks ago. And so I would take two weeks times seven, and I'd have, so I made it a continuous variable. It was a 14 days. Or they might say it was two months ago, so I took two months times 30 days. It was 60 days. But I was really interested in looking at when they first learned about hospice as an option and when they actually enrolled in hospice. And, and that was my de decision time variable. Yes. No, I didn't. That's a great question, though, because I do think that's separate um, from when they first learn about it. And, and I think there would be great discrepancy there. Yes? Just how would it be anticipated? It's probably brought up at different periods of time. Uh huh. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and uh, what, I had wanted, what I really wanted to be able to do is go back and 
look through medical charts and see when did the doctor document talking, right? And I mean, that was just impractical because all of these patients were coming to, um, from this one particular hospice agency, right? Um, so I was, I was limited to the data that I could get at the time. It's not accurate in the chart versus patients, what patients say. Yeah, I, I would believe that there's discrepancies there. But I do also think it's important in thinking about what patients remember of when they were referred and how long their decision-making time was. So it's kind of a different way of looking at hospice utilization, and it led to some interesting findings that I'll share with you all. The third study um, that, that, that came out of that was um, looking at this understanding or the meaning of hospice. The meaning of hospice was, was one of these themes that came out from the qualitative study. So I included it, and this was really um, a continuation. I, I was collecting this data at the same time that I was collecting. So study two and three are, are, are done together, but separately, if that makes sense, because I was collecting this data but analyzed it later. But I was really looking at what was your perception of hospice care when you first learned about it in terms of your illness. So what did you think about hospice care? And then secondly, I asked them, because this, remember, I'm doing these interviews where they're in hospice care, and my second question was, what do you think about hospice today? And really looking, were there differences between um, what they thought about hospice when they first learned about it in terms of their illness and what they thought about hospice with the experience? Uh, and I just loved this cartoon. I want to know the meaning of life. Have you tried Googling it? Isn't that how we get all our answers? Right. Um, but this was the third study that I'll be referencing. And then I had a team of coders who went and coded those statements um, on a zero to four Likert scale. So it was from very positive to very negative, which I don't love that categorization, but it's how I did it at the time. And very positive um, was related to the services, the people, um, and the, a lot of people used superlatives, like it was great. Um, and then the very negative was related to um, really the association with death um, and, and other kinds of negative statements. Just a quick look at the sample for the studies two and three. I had a sample of 90, um, and again, because a lot of hospice patients weren't able to answer the questions due to their illness and the degree of their illness, um, it was their decision maker. It had to be the person who signed them up for hospice. That was the person that I targeted to answer the questions. But patients were able to answer the questions um, is who I preferred if they were able to. So of those 90, 32 patients participated, and the, other, the remaining 58 were family members. You can see mean age of 71. Um, as far as racial dem demographics, it was split similarly to what national demographics are for hospice, 82% Caucasian. But some of the other statistics weren't really comparable to what we would expect in a national sample. Um, and of course, this was really, a, this was based on um, who I was, who was referred to me um, by nurses and, and social workers and chaplains. Um, and I, and there were problems with that, but it's based on how quickly um, people turn over in hospice care and what hospice was allowing me to do um, to get access to those patients. Some general um, other information, there were high levels of self-reported spirituality, family communication, and satisfa satisfaction with physician communication, um, which may have impacted the, the lack of um, variance within those, uh, impacted some of my findings related to length of stay, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but, but really want to talk some more about this idea of decision time and some of the things that came out from the study for that, and the meaning of hospice as well. So here we are with our magnifying glass, really wanting to look at um, these families who are making this decision for hospice. And so there's six different areas that I want to briefly talk about. Um, the first of which is family referrals, um, and then how important communication is as to when patients and how patients are making the decision to, to join hospice. Also the idea of turning points and um, how important those key points are and when families make decisions for hospice. Prior experiences that make a difference in, this, in choosing hospice in the future. This understanding of what hospice means. And as well as, and those first five are actually the findings from the qualitative study, but I've, I'll implement some of the data from the second follow-up studies within those. And then the last one, I'll look at differences in decision time across particular variables. So in the first study that I did, my sample was 18, um, and this was the qualitative study. And, but one of the things that really struck, stuck out to me was looking at um, where they learned about hospice from. 
and 44% of my sample learned about hospice from a family member or a friend, or were referred to hospice by a family member or a friend. This does not mean that a physician didn't tell them about hospice, it just simply means that there was also, or instead, a family member or a friend who referred them. Um, and, and the other part of that sample there were, was um, referred only by a medical professional. And if you look at length of stay, and, and I went ahead and included all the lengths of stay for both sides, um, but it was nearly four times, the mean of length of stay on hospice was nearly four times longer for those who, were, um, who learned about hospice from a family member or a friend compared to those who learned about hospice from a physician alone. And I really thought this was interesting because we already know physicians, physicians are really influential in um, our decision making for care. Um, but I thought it was really also interesting to think about how, what hospice means changes based on who it is that's giving us the information, right? Um, and so, so if a family member is saying, hey, you should really think about hospice, there's got to be something to that if this length of stay is so different. So I wanted to look at that um, in larger numbers in the, the follow-up study. Unfortunately, I didn't get the same finding in my follow-up study, but I also didn't get, um, the, my length of stay didn't even um, correlate with any of the variables that we saw as barriers. So there were a lot of problems with my length of stay variable um, in, in the larger study, and this was with 90. And I think it really uh, was related to how I was getting these referrals. Um, and you know, if you look at my length of stay compared to the national average, patients were on hospice, it was one out of every two died within um, just over a month, and in national averages, one out of every two dies in like 18 days. Length of stay was much longer for my population in my study versus um, national population. There were some other things that I could show you. Um, but nonetheless, I didn't have great, great findings related to length of stay. But I did want to highlight um, what was interesting with referrals. Yes. who was referred to this, to hospital, no, and that's one of my limitations I'll talk about at the end. This was all drawn from, so all of this data that I'm talking to you all about is coming from people who chose hospice. And I think that that's really important, what you're saying, and I talk about that at the end, and that we really have to get the flip side of this coin, which is, why are people not choosing hospice? Yes, great point. Um, so in looking at referral source as a predictor for decision time, and remember decision time is the, t the amount of time it takes when someone is referred to hospice and when they actually enroll in hospice care. And if you look down here, you can say, you know, about 6% of the variance in decision time when run alone was explained by referral source. And, and again, referral source was zero um, by a physician alone or one, the presence of a family referral. So then I added in all of my control variables that were correlated with decision time. And you can see here what those were. Um, and, and then now if you look at the, um, the amount of variance explained in decision time, it's 48%, 48%, right, of this model is explained by um, primarily functional status and use of treatment. Just including those two variables knocked referral source just above, um, if you look at my, um, is no longer statistically significant at the 0.05 or 0.01 level. Um, but, but this idea, and I think that what this tells us is really what we already know, right? Um, that functional status, which was measured using the PPS, the palliative performance scale, which is really just a measure of how sick someone is, um, people are coming to hospice when they're really, really sick. And they're making decisions very, very quickly because they have to. They have, they're already dying when they're referred to hospice. Um, and then also the use of treatment, right, is the other large, large predictor there, in that people aren't coming to hospice, which we already know from eligibility, until um, they're through with active treatment, right? So, so there's no real surprises there, um, but I just thought it was really, you know, that it's explaining 50% of the model, I think, is really significant there, and it kind of reinforces what we already know. So the second, second area of our magnifying glass is looking at communication. So the first one was family referrals, and now we're looking at communication. So this was primarily from my, from my qualitative study and asking, asking patients and families about their process to making decisions for hospice. Uh, and, and one of the things that came out was this idea of transmissions of values. So 
Um, one person said, you know, it's, I guess, tradition that it's mainly the woman that handles the parent situation. So this idea that it was the daughter's job, it was her duty to take care of her parents. Um, and, you know, I think we really need to put on a positive face and a positive front when we're with Pappy. This idea um, that we have to protect people who are sick, right? That we can't really talk about the hard stuff because we got to put, put on the positive face and, and, and just keep going. Um, and, and a second one that I thought spoke to protection was this idea of my dad did not want mom to have to stay at home if he had died there. That was important for him to protect her whether she needed it or not. So there were all of these kinds of statements that came out from these interviews that really spoke to um, families' values and how that impacted the types of decisions that they were making and how they made those decisions. A second theme related to communication that came out was these patterns of communications. A lot of families talked about um, patterns of open communication related to calling family meetings. You know, we all talk, all of us that's here right now, we all bring in whatever and we share. We talk about it, wh whatever we agree on, and that's what's gonna happen. Or mom called a meeting with all the kids and all of our spouses so that we could make some tentative plans because we could see that things were not progressing the way we wanted them to. So really a lot of these statements that reflected around gathering for discussions, calling a family meeting, talking it through, um, and, and really this was part of their process in making the decision. The flip side of that, co of that coin were those families who were really um, much more closed about their communication. I have to do what my mother taught me. If you want something changed, you bring it up in a general conversation and give them a few days, and then it's their idea. And when it's their idea, they're, they're more, than willing, more willing to go flow with it. All right, so this idea of kind of putting in these little plugs for something and kind of prodding someone along into this decision that you want them to make, but not really being able to say, hey, I think that you should be on hospice and here's why, but rather planting seeds um, as this kind of pattern of closed communication. And, and another, you know, a, a husband and his wife um, spoke about, we thought, well, no use to tell them as long as we could keep this cancer small and under control. But this time we were forced to tell them, right? So this idea of, of not wanting to talk about it until they have to talk about it. And also uh, how important health communication is in, in the process of decision making for hospice care. I think knowledge is power, really doing the research and looking into what is out there for them. And I think families really talked about that, that they were going and they were seeking information from the doctor, they were seeking information from friends, they were just seeking all of it from the internet. How many of you guys love um, when, when people come into your office with pronouns from Google. Um, but people are doing that. They're seeking this information, right? And, and they're also starting to identify five goals of care, which I think is a part of this process of advanced care planning that we hope for, right? We want people to be thinking about what they want in the, pro in the progression of their illness. Um, and, and people were doing that and starting to think, well, really, his comfort is my number one priority. Or, no, I want to go home. That's the priority. So how can we go home? And hospice was the avenue for getting someone home. So, so I think if we're looking in the context of advanced care planning or conversations that you all have with patients, and that's really something that we have to, to think about. Families are wanting the information and they're wanting, um, and, and as they identify goals, that's really the time to be having this conversation as well. The third area um, in, the, in the looking glass is, is the turning point, right? And understanding when people make decisions, it's often related to a crisis or a period of decline. Um, and, and people talked about this. They, they weren't ready to make a decision when they were bumping along, but when there was a huge turning point in their care or a crisis, then they had to make some different decisions in care. When you've got heart problems, you've got breathing problems, you've got a lot of other problems, and then decline, decline, until she was bedridden, and the quality of life is completely gone. And so people are waiting to make these decisions until these declines. Um, seeing him not to be able to do the things that he always did, to have him just sit in a recliner because he can't walk six feet without gasping for air. And what we know about hospice, if we were to go back to that original slide on, on why hospice, why choose hospice, is that hospice can, um, can avert crises. Hospice can keep people out of the hospital. Um, hospice can help with breathing issues, right? Um, but people are waiting until these are happening before they'll make the, the transition to hospice. Um, exhaustive medicine and delay and insurance and financial are several other reasons that um, are other kind of turning points um, for care. 
um, you know, I didn't think, I don't think he had any clue the toll that chemo and radiation was going to take on him. I wasn't even thinking, are we going to be making him suffer? And that wasn't something that even entered into the conversation that the, you know, um, what are the ramifications of some of these treatments at this point or this stage, and what does that look like? Some of those things weren't even talked about, and some of those things aren't talked about a lot of times and, and are not a part of the equation in making decisions for hospice sometimes. Um, you know, and this one, I think this next one really speaks to this idea of how insurance um, drives decisions for care at times. And that, well, I mean, if it's to the point where there is no more treatment, I would strongly recommend going with hospice. So here's someone saying, yes, I recommend hospice, but only after no more treatment is, is available, right? So it's this idea of, well, we can't choose hospice until we choose not to do more treatment. And lastly, I liked this one too, um, or I didn't like it, but it's, it's, as an example of, of how insurance and financial decisions drive these decisions for care. And that, but on the 20th day of nursing home stay, I called hospice and said, hey, I want to sign her up with you all. Well, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're not, your stay's no longer paid for. You got to make a different decision. So now I'm ready to choose hospice 20 days into my nursing home stay, right? So there's this idea of how influential these, these um, policies are and when people are choosing hospice. In the, in the second study that I looked at with decision time, um, differences by diagnosis was one thing that came out as, as um, significant. So I dummy coded, I didn't look at diagnoses across because I, but, but looked at cancer versus non-cancer and, um, and saw that patients who had cancer were taking longer to decide to go to hospice versus patients who didn't have cancer. And this supports prior literature that talks about this as well. And really this is tied to the first three things of turning point as well, right? It's, it's tied to um, crises and um, decline for those patients who don't have cancer. That's kind of when they're making their decision. And exhaustive medicine or delay and insurance and financial is, is really um, for these patients with cancer. Um, not making, their, their decision is tied to beginning and ending stages of um, treatment. Threshold of caregivers was another turning point. People weren't ready or willing to choose hospice until they were at their wits' ends as a caregiver, right? Um, kind of pulling their hair out, not knowing what else to do, really needing support. So, so at that point is when people were saying, oh, well, have you thought about hospice? You know, when we know if we start sooner with that, then we can really alleviate some of these caregiving concerns sooner. And acknowledgement of death is another one. People weren't really sometimes really willing to consider hospice until they were really willing to accept or acknowledge that death was happening. One of the things that I always say as someone who's taking care of a lot of patients at the end of life, you know, acknowledging death isn't something that has to happen to be on hospice care, right? I've certainly taken care of people who have refused to acknowledge that they're dying until the day, you know, even up until the day that they're gone. Uh, and that's okay. I think hospice can still serve them even if they're unwilling to acknowledge um, that they're dying and finding ways to, um, to think about what hospice can provide them that they need versus just focusing on this idea that it's for people who are dying. Prior experiences um, is the next kind of area that, that I wanted to highlight. And that people who, and there were a lot of people in that, that first study of where there were, they were volunteers in hospice, right? So they were really instrumental in getting their loved one on hospice or they had a, a loved one on hospice care and they really wanted their family member to come on care and really had positive feelings about hospice care based on those prior experiences. Differences in decision time, um, there were differences based on prior hospice exposure. And actually, the, uh, this is what was interesting to me, those who were um, who did have prior experiences actually took longer to get to hospice. I think a lot of that is tied to how much earlier they were talking about it in the process versus those who were really sick and actively dying had just learned about hospice and were having to make this decision um, based on some of the other findings with that study. And, and this was another interesting finding related to prior experiences was this exposure to um, death and illness. So people who had um, been around death previously, whether that was with a loved one or one gentleman um, who talked about having served and been in war before and had just had a, a more coarse um, kind of description or understanding of what death was and was more willing to talk about it. So if we're thinking about assessments and how we're talking to people, really 
talking to them, one, have they had prior experiences? What are their prior experiences with death and loss? How does that impact the type of information and how they want to receive that information about care moving forward for themselves? I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of time. I think I've packed a lot of information in here. Um, but the meaning of hospice, this was, so this was my third study, of kind of the follow-up of really trying to understand how the meaning of hospice changes with the experience of hospice. And really, how can we understand um, this idea of what the hospice decision looks like without understanding what, how people perceive hospice? So here were some of the negative perceptions when I asked people, when you first learned about hospice care, what did it mean to you? The end is coming. It's a reality kick, a punch in the gut. Um, no matter how you word it, the end is coming. No more hope. There's nothing else we can do, which I've heard time and time again um, from patients who say, well, the doctor told me there was nothing else that they could do, so they sent me to hospice, right? And I'd, like, I'd say, well, there's a ton of things that we can do for you here. Um, so that phrasing, but it, it continues to kind of come up. That doctor was passing me off. He was no longer interested in helping me. We cannot help you anymore. You need to go to hospice. Or my understanding was that the hospital just wanted me out. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, hospice is a place, not as a service. I think that was really interesting. People are, are, when they think about hospice, many people perceived that hospice was this place. They didn't even know that you could receive hospice out in the community. So this idea that this is the perception that, that a lot of the public has about what hospice is. A place to die, or I knew he wasn't going to come home, or a facility where they'll take care of him, an alternative to the nursing home. And, and lastly, focus on the disease. Um, the illness or the symptoms. So hospice to them was about that, the disease or the sickness, sickness, frailty. Um, my heart was so weak that I could go at any minute. And then the flip side of that was, was the meaning of hospice on the positive side. So I was asking people, and I'll show you the change here in a second, but so what does hospice mean to you today? Right, and these are, remember my sample were all people who were already receiving hospice care. Comfort, a way for mom to escape constant suffering to control pain levels and keep her comfortable. Family support. Hospice would be a good crutch for me in case I fell or something. It's an extra set of eyes and extra care. Someone comes in and they take a load off of family caregivers. So this idea that, that hospice isn't just about the patient but about the family. It's about the loving and caring staff. So many people were talking about um, the people who were taking care of me, or the people taking care of mom, how dedicated they are, how, how caring they are, how loving they are. Everything, everyone is wonderful. Um, you are coming to really special people. Dignity and peace were the, were the other two that really came out in the positive. So in looking at initial perceptions versus perceptions now, and this is my sample of 90, um, you know, and you can kind of see where people fell in, in initial perceptions and how that changed to perceptions now. Uh, and some of the things that stood out to me um, was really this idea that hospice became less about death and more about the services, about the people, about the care, about um, the versus death, the, the illness, the symptoms um, initially. But it also may reinforce um, beliefs in that someone may come to hospice thinking that it's a place and leave hospice still believing that because they came on and died four days later in the inpatient unit. So there were some, some instances where people came on and left very quickly and, and it kind of reinforced it, some of these negative beliefs related to um, how quickly people came on and died. And, and reinforcing that um, hospice really is about death because I came on hospice and I died 24 hours later. Some correlations that were interesting um, that I think really stood out to me, family communication about illness and death was positively associated with the meaning for hospice. So, so families in, and who were communicating positively about illness and death um, had more positive uh, understandings of hospice. Um, and same with satisfaction with physician communication, which was really interesting. So I, I asked them how satisfied they were with the physician communication about hospice. And, um, those who, and there was a positive association there, so those who were, have, and remember there wasn't a lot of variance in this, but people who were um, satisfied with their physician communication also had more positive association, which again goes back to show how important these early conversations are about reframing hospice care.
and what it means and what it can do for people. I couldn't give this talk without highlighting one final finding in terms of differences of um, decision time. Particularly if you look, and I've talked about the diagnosis in prior hospice exposure, but if you look at the middle two here, um, and looking at race and then looking at income. So I, I split these up into two groups, looking at um, white versus non-white, and then looking at an income over $50,000 and then income lower than $50,000. And this, um, if you look at mean and decision time, so when they first learned about hospice and when they actually, and this is in number of days, when they first learned about hospice and when they actually made the decision to come on to hospice services. And you can see there's, there's a, a huge difference there. Um, and, and really thinking about what this means and what we already know about health disparities and, and how people are accessing information and when they're accessing that information. But these um, short decision times are likely reflect delays in learning about hospice for minority and poor populations. Uh, and patients may either seek services later or receive information later due to cultural or systematic barriers that we already know about. Um, but I think that this study would just really reinforced that for me and I found that, that finding pretty interesting. Uh, and how important it is to be aware of that in, when we're communicating with patients about services. Some limitations of, of some of the information that I've shared to you all from my studies um, is that it was self-reported. Um, the estimated measure of this idea of decision time uh, and, and, and pinpointing having how, how accurately can someone really remember the exact time that someone spoke with them. Um, and also the, the fact that I was getting information from patients and from families based on whether or not the patient could, could participate. It was always um, the decision maker that I was speaking to, but, um, but certainly some, some challenges there. There were also limitations in sampling that I talked about. Um, and again, this, I was focusing on those only accessing hospice care. And I think to get the full um, picture here, you have to also be asking questions from those who don't end up accessing hospice services. Uh, and I also was drawing all of this from one sample, from one provider, right? So I wasn't looking at a variety of hospice providers. Um, I was in Texas, and this was a large provider. I looked at, at three different sites, but it was still only, it was a nonprofit. Um, and, and there may be differences too if you look at profit versus nonprofit, but ultimately that's a, certainly a limitation. And also my dependence on staff for referrals. Um, and really just working with the hospice and getting patients. One of their requirements in collecting any data from patients who were in nursing homes, they um, wanted an administrator to sign off that it was okay that I was collecting data from their patients. Um, and, and in order, and they wouldn't let me go to these nursing home facilitators or administrators and say, hey, I'm doing this study, it's signed off, yada, yada, here's all about it. Can I, you know, this patient that's in your facility is on hospice care and I'll be doing some study with them. Um, they wanted their marketers to be the ones doing that, which was just a nightmare. Um, so I never really got um, connected to nursing homes. Uh, but was, so all of my sample came from inpatient facility and from home. And I think that was a real limitation. And also, you know, staff and, and of the hospice learned about my study. They knew that I was interested in this idea of family communication. And no matter what kind of training that I gave them about how to refer patients, that we need all kinds of patients. Everyone is eligible as long as they're an adult. They speak English, da, 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 whatever. Um, they would think, oh, this family really communicates well. Let's refer them to CARES study. So, so they were kind of biasing my sample based on who they thought would be best for it, um, which was a challenge as well. Some conclusions going back to my objectives. I just wanted to highlight each one once more. Understanding patient and family motivations for choosing hospice care, the timing of that decision, and what factors precipitate the choice for hospice. Uh, patients and families often wait for a turning point before enrolling in care. And positive perceptions um, are really the meaning of hospice and what that means. And prior experiences of hospice influences the choice for hospice care. And I think when we're looking at assessment, um, those are things that we can ask about. It, you know, when we're having that conversation about hospice, well, have you heard about hospice before? What does that mean to you? And really doing some, some good education there. Demonstrating the role of family in the decision for hospice. So really recognizing how important family is during this process and seeing that the family values and the, how families are communicate impact um, this decision and this process. And, and that patients who learn about hospice from a family member or a friend are discussing hospice as an option earlier and they're discussing, and they're on hospice for longer. Of course, recognizing the limitations of the studies as I say this. Um, and, and certainly there's future work to be done. <laughs>
And families are often seeking knowledge about services prior to them being mentioned by a doctor. There's a lot of um, studies, too, that suggest that physicians um, underestimate the amount of information that people want related to services, and, and I think this is an indication of that as well, and that families are, are actively seeking this information, um, and we need to be willing to provide it earlier so that they have the time to make the decisions about care. And this is just reinforcing what I'm already saying, but really in the importance of having conversations early. And that family communication about illness and death is positively associated with the meaning of hospice. So how can we help facilitate these conversations for families? Um, and how can we help all patients access services in a more timely way? And my challenge or hope um, for you all and, and, and as providers and as healthcare professionals is really to think about how you can play a part in reframing what hospice care means for people and how that meaning of hospice really plays a, fact, or plays a big part in um, when and why and how people choose hospice and what we can say about it uh, and how we do that. And for me, and what I've learned is that um, hospice is not really just about death. It's more about how, how we can help people live well. As you all know, it's really difficult to, to pinpoint a time when someone dies. And um, so I, people often ask that, well, how long do I have? Well, I don't know, but what, what I do know is that we can help you feel the best that you can during that time. Here's how, you know, or what's important to you and how can we help meet those goals. Really kind of reframing that that's what hospice is about. So this is you. I hope you see yourself in this picture, right? I will talk with my patients and families early about advanced care planning and options for end-of-life care. I will help reframe what hospice care actually is and what it means for the patient and the family. And lastly, I will refer to hospice. Questions, comments? I just liked this quote. Yes. I'm actually doing some really, an, a really interesting study of looking at um, this idea of live discharge from hospice, and, and disproportionately, it is these uh, these dementia patients who. And, and all of that is tied to Medicare. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, and, and I, would, I, would tend to, I would tend to agree with you that that's what, where we hope to end up, but that's not where we are. I mean, the, the fact is that people aren't receiving that kind of care separate from hospice often. Well, what it is, I mean, this is what I find really with, with many but not all nursing homes. Uh-huh. 
something that's... Well, and that's one thing that they're going to be reporting on nursing homes now, right, is this, this rehospitalization, um, which may be, there may be room for, for greater collaboration there. And like you said, how hard that sometimes is based on family schedules, when they're coming, if the family even lives in town, See, right? I know. Yeah, I agree. Thank you all for allowing me to come visit with you. I'm happy to talk about this stuff anytime.